Hi everybody out there, we hope there's loads and loads of you watching. Last night we had record views from Michael Mulcahy and today I'm sure we're going to hit the roof because look who's sitting opposite me. I don't think you need any introduction. Dale Clevenger, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. It's nice to see you. It's nice great to, to see you. Well, you are in Indiana. With, uh, I am uh, teaching this week. And, uh, and who, who is... Um, Oh, sorry. We have to get you. We have to get used to the. the you, am I loud enough for you? Can you hear me? Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I come down about to, once a month. Once a month. Yeah. To teach whose yeah. students? Who? Uh, there. I teach. I have technically five of my own, and then then anybody else in the whole class of fifty who signs up for lessons can get a lesson. And they are. They are Jeff's. Jeff Nelson students are they? That's where he teaches, and he's just behind the camera. He's working the camera today for you. Yes, come say hi, Jeff. Come say hi, Jeff. Hi. How's Hello. it going? Good morning. Great to see you again. Yeah, you too. Hi, everybody. You guys, I have someone here too that wants to say hello. Okay. We just like to hang out. It's a hangout. So there's someone here. For oh yes, my goodness. Your mouth stops open. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, really good. I look a little bit uh, like a drowned rat. I just came in with this mucky weather outside. And, uh, how's, how's my Scottish friend? <laughs> that's right, but the, water, the water rolls off my back. I don't worry about it. How's, <laughs> how's my Canadian friend? Who, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Fergus, Fergus changes his accent. If he's just come back from holiday in Canada, he speaks like Canadian. If he comes out from Scotland, you don't understand a word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't want to. I'm sorry, <laughs> And you don't oh, want to? Oh, yeah. What's, how's it going, eh? Nice to see you. you. guys, let's get to the nitty gritty. Thank you so much, Fergus. Look, look you've already had uh, people saying hello to you on the chat. Hello, Ken <laughs> Okay, you guys are going to get started. There's a lot of people want to hear what you have to talk about. Okay. Good to see you, Dave. Fergus will, be on, Fergus will be on on his own very, very soon, talking about his new book. So he promised oh, okay. to keep it. So. Okay. okay. Off you go. See you later. Okay, Dale, it's you and yeah. me and hundreds of horn players out there. Um, we have all sorts of questions uh, that they are asking on the chat. But first of all, if I can ask you just some sort of general stuff, because we haven't seen each other for a while and a lot has happened since, uh, since I last saw you. May I congratulate you to your, to your wedding? You certainly may. Uh, Giovanna Grassi from Brescia, Italy and I got married <laughs> and uh, I hope I think she's trying to watch this she's trying to get on uh, we were married August 6th in uh, in my hometown now our, our hometown in Chicago uh, Winneka and then we had a big Italian party which might as well have been another wedding because there were 120 people there uh, in uh, Montichiari, Italy. I saw, I saw pictures of it on Facebook, good old Facebook, you know, that's, that's why. And I saw you in a very dapper white suit doing some dancing. Well, it was a crew, actually. <laughs> oh, a and, crew, yes. sorry. It looked white on the photos. <laughs> yes. And uh, uh, it was a, a fantastic wedding and a fantastic party. And, <coughs> excuse me. She and I have been, yeah, I'm getting over a cold, but I'm nearly over it. She and I have been crossing back and forth in be, uh, between September the 2nd and now, just, just to be together. Great. And she was here last week and went home, and I'm going to Italy on uh, December the 12th uh, to be there. Well period of time. We are, very, we are all very, very happy that you found happiness again because you've had a bit of a rough ride recently. Yes, I have. I, I have. But it's the grief is subsiding considerably. The memories will always be there. And Giovanna and I are starting a new chapter, a new book, a new, you know, a, a new life together. And she's wonderful and she agreed to marry me and I'm, I'm very, very lucky in many ways. 
Congratulations from all of us, everyone watching out there. People are writing congratulations on the, on the chat already. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tell me, um, how many years have you been in the, in the Chicago Symphony? We had Michael on last night talking about you know, the good old days and everything. We all, we all are desperate to hear about Chicago Symphony history. Um, how many years have you been there? 47. Oh, that's outrageous. That's amazing. <laughs> In February, it'll be 48. I hope there's going to be a big party. Well, whenever I retire, and of course I know that at my age and at this amount of time in the orchestra, people all, the world, all over the world are surmising, well, when is he going to retire? When is he going to quit? When is he going to hang it up, uh, etc.? cetera. And, and sometimes the critics are, are the worst at that. Of course, they're very good at keeping score. Yeah. You know that. Yeah. Uh, but I'll quit when I feel like it, when I want to. Uh, my playing during my grief period went, uh, was, was not at the level that I wanted it to be, and that's, that happens during times like that. But uh, things are coming back, and to what level they come back, I don't know, but I'm still having fun. I still love to play. I'm not playing as much as I used to. My colleagues are filling in for me, and, and Dan Gingrich is playing fantastic solo horn when I'm not there. And, and uh, uh, so we're, I'm thinking about the, the retirement time. I'm not exactly sure when. So, you know, tell the world, stop asking, leave me alone, let me decide myself. And, okay, uh, you heard that on the internet live on these hangouts, leave Dale alone and stop asking, leave him alone to play and do his job. Right, there we go, we got that one cleared up. It could be, it could be in three months, it could be in three years, but uh, it probably won't be longer than that. Okay, well. I have, a new life, I have a new life and I want to enjoy my new life to its fullest in every way possible, both in America and in Italy, which will be the case a lot. Sure. So you are traveling, apart from your CSO job, you're traveling the world doing all this teaching and master classes. Last time we met was in Italy at the Brass Week. Um, no, I think the last time we met was one year ago in Japan. It was. It was in the bar of the hotel. Right. My <laughs> friend Chio, Chio brought me over to the hotel. We, you and I, and uh, uh, Eric Terwilliger. Eric. We spent and John. 30 we spent 30 minutes together, but uh, it, was, it was a very nice, uh, very quick meet, but this is the way it is sometimes. So. Yeah. Well, it's better to meet in person because then I can give you a hug. You can't really do that via Google, but... Uh. <laughs> okay, Dale, would you mind if I started to ask you some stuff about the good old days in the Chicago Symphony? Because we were all so fascinated from this Hertha, Hertha Jake times. When you guys started, it was a real pack wasn't it? A brass player pack. You guys created this Chicago Symphony Orchestra brass legend. Um, yeah. Were you guys always so good or how did you build it up? Well, uh, a little preface. When I was in high school, my band director used to play recordings of the Chicago Symphony during lunch period and that's what we listened to. And I was listening to Herseth and Jacobson and and all the rest of the brass players there, uh, Kleinhammer and so forth. And this was 1956, seven and eight, when, when they had just, in the very beginnings of, the, of, of their tenure, not the total beginnings, but, but then seven years later, I was lucky enough to get in the orchestra and join them. And uh, it's been a fantastic wild ride ever since. I, can't, I still can't believe it. That I that I have done it, and I'm still doing it. Uh, but play, playing with those fellows is, is really almost undescribable. When 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 people play, I, I know the world of brass brass playing is in an unfortunate state of they don't want nobody wants to hear any missed notes. Well, that means that you're perfect, and nobody is perfect. No, not. Not even in the Berlin Philharmonic. <laughs> Thank goodness you left that little bit on your, your record to show that you guys also make mistakes. 
That's why we did it, because the, the mistakes were the funniest part of the recording. That's why they're on the <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I've actually heard Jacob miss a note and Herseth miss a note, a note. <laughs> but not just the perfect, near, near perfect playing accuracy wise. It was nearly perfect the way they played all the time. Always the right style. You know, always trying for for the best possible quality, no matter who is conducting, no no matter uh, what piece we played or where we were. You know, and the level of inspiration went up uh, proportionally to the concert, the great concert halls or the tours that we played, and it was sometimes simply unbelievable. Have you ever participated in an encore that was 20 minutes long? <laughs> no. <laughs> 20, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. The New York audience in the Carnegie Hall clapped when we finished Mahler 5. We were, we were, we were timing our clocks. When are they going to stop? And That's we very unusual for New York because they do get up and like to go home. They're usually standing. They, they didn't move. Nobody moved. And this was 1971. Wow. We knew with with Schulte that we had something very, very special going uh, because of that. And and then we, we did it so many times. I played Mahler five over a hundred times. And and you know things happen. You know, I, I, I've never played anything perfect in my life. Is the world listening to that? <laughs> Never a rehearsal or a concert that was totally perfect. I mean, and, and look what the world thinks is note perfect. Yeah, that's what but, I was just about to say. Is it note perfect for you or is it really, it's not about getting the notes, it's about getting the music, isn't it? It's about, it's about the style, a beautiful slur, a, 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 the bloom of a sound. The, the, uh, it's not just about accuracy. You know, I played many concerts where, where, it was, where it was, you know, very, very accurate. But if I don't make a slur or, or an entrance ensemble may not be quite together. You know, we know that, but most of the world never knows it. They don't hear that. Most of them refuse to hear it if, yeah. if anything is not quite right. But the fact is that perfection is right up here all the time. Here on the horn, maybe 99, maybe 98, whatever. With Herseth, it was pr pretty much <laughs> almost 100 all the time. The rascal, the rascal just almost never did anything wrong. I never heard him miss a note. I mean, it was really just incredible. I well, didn't hear him as much as you did, but he was just a phenomenon. He was. J Arnold Jacobs called him, referred to him as the greatest living brass player. And that's Arnold Jacobs' opinion. I happen to agree with it. And I hope that maybe Herseth is watching this. Uh, he's, he's, uh, he's very much missed as a musician, as a trumpet player, and as a, a, a persona. And that's what the Chicago Symphony, that's what it was when I came into it. A whole group of personas, of people who played extraordinarily beautiful all the time. Perfect, no, but extraordinarily beautiful. And it makes the level of, of my playing just keep rising and keep coming up. And my my uh, uh, my own personal standards just kept going up and up and up and up because of the people around me. Did I you, I, I remember saying to you once in a master class, I saying, you know, Dale, can you talk about breathing? And you were like, just breathe. <laughs> oh, water. Get down yeah. some water, Jeff. Get down some water. <laughs> yeah, my, my, I'm getting over a cold, and my. Um, I hope I don't lose my voice here if I keep it calm. Thank you. <laughs> That's mine. <laughs> okay. That's the disadvantage of this. Much better to be in the same room. Um, you were, you were this, this whole Chicago breathing thing, we touched on it yesterday. It, it, and whether you think it's a natural way of breathing or not, it became a cult for all of us because you guys were famous.
for really being able to use your air so well. Did you do that naturally, or did you pick some stuff up from Jake, or was it just... Yes, yes and yes. Uh, I have to assume that, that certain things that I did were instinctively good and instinctively right, yeah. but it was all confirmed and helped daily, on a daily basis, by Jacobs, by, and we talked hours backstage, on buses, on tours, you know, about uh, the, the process of breathing and, and, you know, with him it was basically very simple, song and wind, yeah. very simple. Now, you can take each of those and you can take them apart and discuss it ad nauseum ad, ad, over and over and over. And so many people came to Jacob needing help with the way they played, with the, with their, the physical part of their playing, their breathing. And I don't know, I, I, it's impossible to know how many careers he saved just by them being there and him showing them sometimes simple things, sometimes complicated things, to, to, to breathe more efficiently. I mean, we don't have time on this show to, uh, this show. Uh, this, this show. Uh, da, 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 da. <laughs> we don't have time to talk about lots and lots of details uh, about, about breathing, but uh, there's an awful lot of misinformation out there. I and know. There, has been, there has been from the beginning. Yes. You know. Well, I would suggest maybe if we if we use this show um, as to sort of the general stuff, the CSO stuff, what you're doing now, and but get you, we can do. I mean, it's so easy. Next time you're back with, with Jeff, and we can get you on, and we can really do a day, you know, a, a show about breathing because uh, there are a lot of myths out there, and I I didn't actually, I was way way off course until I came and played with you guys, and. Um, and I, I went to breathe for Charlie, and Charlie said, take the deepest breath you can, and I took the deepest breath I could, and I was about to burst, and he said, did you breathe yet? Uh, <laughs> so I was doing something wrong somewhere. Um, I remember Alice, um, you know, your, your, your wife, who I, I sat behind, watching her fill up with air, it was just incredible, you know, but yeah. that, that was very special to the way you guys played. Well, uh... Obviously, everybody has a different amount of fuel available in your lungs. An interesting fact uh, that has come with age with me is that I started out in the Chicago Symphony and Arnold Jacobs measured me. I had in excess of six liters of air. Oh, lucky thing. <laughs> six in excess. Now it's barely five. Oh, wow. So I have 3.4, that means I'm going to have like one. Yeah. You, no, you, you, you just have to make sure that you take the maximum nearly every breath. Yeah. And that's what, you, that's what you do, or you couldn't play the way you do. Yeah. But uh, I have to function with four and a half to five liters as best I possibly can. Well, it means I have to breathe more often. Yeah. And... Uh, I'm doing a, a little diagnostic test with all my students now. It's rather interesting. And since we have this, you know, I'll tell you briefly what it is. Yeah, please do. Please do. All right. You take a note below the staff, any note, concert C, written, written G, and you play it as soft as humanly possible, as long as possible. And hold it like like it's like your life depends on it, as soft as pianissimo as possible. Most people can go somewhere between thirty and forty-five seconds. A few of my students have gone up to a minute. I heard when I was young, I heard that Dennis Brain could hold a note for ninety seconds. I ninety doubt, seconds. I seriously doubt that because I have some very big people around me, Jeff and my son, and some very tall, you know, and they cannot do it. 
and, and brain was not that tall. But 60 seconds, maybe 70 seconds, that's fine. This is interesting information. This is not criteria. Then you take the same note and you play mezzo forte. And you hold it as long as you can. The time goes way down to somewhere between 12 and 20 seconds. Okay? Then you take the same note and you hold it, you play it as loud as you possibly can, period. Beauty is not the criteria. Loudness is the criteria. I have not had anybody, nobody who's played it longer than seven seconds. Wow. I can only do four, four or five seconds. Do you think, uh, Anna has just asked a question that I find very interesting, do you think you can expand your lung capacity or do you just have what you have? You have what you have, basically. You can exercise your lungs, you can, uh, you can do things to, uh, I don't think you can increase what you actually have. You can maybe increase how you use it. If, if you do it, you know, most people don't take a full lungs load of air when they take a breath. They don't know what that's like. But the next step is you go in the middle register, an octave higher, and you do exactly the same thing. Triple pianissimo, holding a note as long as you can. If, if it cuts out after 10 seconds, you start it again. The idea is to see how long you can go. Then you do mezzo forte, then fortissimo. And the fortissimo is still only five seconds. It's, mm -hmm. it's very interesting to me. Now, Jeff here might be able to do longer than that, but he's a freak anyway. He has seven plus liters. <laughs> my, my, my mom thinks he's pretty gorgeous. 7.89, he just told me. He's a tall boy. <laughs> not live on, Dale, not live on the internet, please. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. We have to sorry. keep some show of decorum around this show. We, we also are human beings. Anyway, <laughs> then you do an octave higher, concert A. Yeah. Something like that, concert B flat. And you do the same thing. Usually the long note gets longer, the pianissimo note. The, the mezzo forte note is about the same. The fortissimo note is a still only about five seconds. And you figure that when we play Mahler's third or something like that, Tchaikovsky fourth, you only hold those notes for two or three seconds before you can take a breath. Yeah. And everybody does take a breath. No, you know, nobody tries to play too long, otherwise you're, you can't maintain a fortissimo. I found this an interesting little study, interesting information. It is not criteria. It is just to let people know what they can actually do. Because I'm going to go and try this, and I hope everyone watching is going to go try this when you're finished as well, except for Tim in Melbourne, because it's now one o'clock in the morning. The big, um. the big, the, the, one of the major things that we do in music on any instrument is sustain sound. Yeah. No matter what instrument. When you do it with a brass instrument, a wind instrument, it's different than on a string instrument, but we sustain sound. Mm -hmm. The next, the other big thing that we do is try to figure out how much to exaggerate. Everything, dynamics, di uh, uh, articulation, uh, tone color, different tone colors, etc., etc. So if you're constantly working on these things and thinking about them, probably your standards are going to keep going up. If you're listening to excellence, singing, cello, other instruments. I just heard Schellenberger yesterday with some flute player, maybe it was Paud, playing duets. It was spectacular. Artistically, sound-wise, everything. When I was driving down here, I heard it on the, on the, uh, uh, on the radio. So wherever we learn, uh, uh, it, it helps our standards and builds our confidence. And that's what that's what actually CSO Brass was all about. I mean, it was really this this that that you guys were maybe you are amazing musicians, but it was this it was this ability to play so naturally with your air that I found so impressive. And that's probably a secret to why all you guys can go on for so long because of so many people that don't use their air 
as well as you do. You know, they tend to get all cramped and, and, the, and they, they rely on their chops and then the chops right. give up after a while. Right, and they, just, they have to retire somewhere between 45 and 50. And this, is, this has been going on since I've been in, since I have known anything about anybody in the music business. When they do not function efficiently, their retirement age gets lower and lower and lower. Yeah. It's going to happen. Yeah. And, and that's, but, but it's because of this misinformation that's out there, you know, you know, you need to support and there's not a, not a correct definition of what that means. You cannot push out your gut while you're actually trying to blow air. It's two different muscle groups working against each other. You do support your body should be in a position that is like an athlete because what we do is very athletic. And when I'm when I'm playing now, I'm more conscious of this being, you know, I I do sit-ups every morning. Really? Fifty of them. Every morning? Every morning. I do 30, 40 push-ups at night. Oh my well, goodness. you may not have to on fourth horn. <laughs> well, but I would do? I would advise uh uh getting your body, your, your abdomen in, in better shape. Mine, oh, is in better. Mine is in better shape than it's been in years. Yeah. No, it doesn't need it. I mean, everyone who has back pains or, or they all are told, I mean, I've been told to you know, strengthen the core muscles, Pilates, yeah. all the rest of it. That's the topic my, for another show, I think, the my, sports. My back pains have disappeared. Fantastic. I've also lost 15 pounds. Yeah, I know. Congratulations. I thought that was your young wife. Yeah, wow. Everybody all whistle together. <laughs> but it's helped, it's helped my breathing. It's helped my back. It's helped me to be more, uh, more poised when yeah. I'm playing. And it's helped my playing, you know. Yeah. Dale, critics, critics haven't heard it yet, but that's their problem. Uh, you don't have to worry about them. We love you. <laughs> um, so you would sit on the tour bus and talk to Jake about all this. Other people talk yep. about girls and beer, but you would talk about um, support and breathing and sit-ups. Correct. He would sometimes tell me who he's working with and sometimes say to me, they are, I cannot tell you who I'm working with. They are too, they are too well known. It's, uh, and they have asked anonymity. Yeah. I could I could tell you some people who came to spend and spend they spent two weeks with him, and very very famous people who were trying to save the tail end of their careers. Yeah. And someone, one of the um, someone's written in at Julius from um, from uh, Julius oh Julius our friend Julius from Poland he wanted to know if you um, were influenced by Philip Farkas at all. Uh, yes. Uh, when, when I was in, when I started Horn, the only, I could not hear live concerts because in, in my hometown, Chattanooga, there, there weren't very many. And so I listened to records constantly of every orchestra that recorded. And I listened to uh, uh, broadcasts. The Metropolitan Opera was broadcasting every Saturday. And so I knew all of the, the solo horns of all these orchestras, and I made a decision. Right now, I am, I am a colleague and working with one of those that I listened to when I was in high school, Mike Bloom. He's right here on campus. Yeah, fantastic. And fantastic. So I, I, I knew, you know, when Gunther Schuller was still playing in the opera, I was listening to him every Saturday. It was before he stopped and, st and composed and conducted. And Isn't that incredible? You, you, you would go and hear all these players live, but now they have you live on their screens. I mean, I, if, I, if I'd had this while I was studying, I would have been a very happy bunny. Oh. I had to come to Chicago to hear you live. That was also great. It's, it's, ama <laughs> it's amazing what's, what's available today. Uh, uh, and, and Jeff is at the forefront of this technology. It, 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 it just it blows my mind what I'm able to do. I'm able to talk with my wife three different ways on my cell phone for free. It's <laughs> I hope just she's watching. Just a picture behind you. Oh yeah. <laughs>
So, you know, it's uh, collectively over over the years. I realized what I was getting, hearing this sound of the trumpet right behind my head all the time, and to my left, uh, Arnold Jacobs and the trombones, and you know the rest of the brass, trying to maintain a standard which was set very early on, even before Herseth. But when Herseth came in the orchestra, it was like, okay, this is the beginning of, of a long era of very fine brass playing. It still is. I mean, the CSO brass is still absolutely amazing. You, 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 uh, do you, you how do you train the new guys? Are they, uh, do you know about them before they get in? Have they, have they played them Abs a lot? Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, our auditions are behind a screen, not like yours, uh, until the very end. Yeah. But so we hear people and we have a sound in our heads that we want. And those that really sound very close to us, they're the ones who make it to the finals. Yeah. And then it gets more I, and more particular. There's a question from Paxman MSO, who I think I know who that is um, in Melbourne, their high school. Um, he wants to know how do you approach repeating performances of the big repertoire? Because you've like played Mahler five a hundred times and five hundred times, Chike five, uh, all the big stuff. How do six you record six recordings of Chike five? Six recordings, wow. Six. How do you approach it? How do you do something different every time? Well, I realize that it, it is inevitable that it's going to be a little bit different every time. Uh, I have this philosophy, Sarah, and it's, it's been a very good philosophy for me. I make everybody happy. Everybody. For those who really like me, however many that is, I make them happy most of the time what I do. For those who are my enemies, if I have any, or who don't like me, or are waiting, waiting anxiously for me to make a mistake, and I make a mistake, I make them happy. I can't lose. <laughs> okay. I cannot lose. They are delighted when I when I s splatter a note. <laughs> oh. Now, I say that sort of in jest, in, in, as as a joke, but it's true. I am lucky enough. We. You and I and Jeff, we are lucky enough when we perform that people want usually want to hear us play. They want to hear us play well. They want to hear this tradition of whatever orchestra we're in carried on. They want to hear us uh, play beautifully, play excitingly, to lift them out of their chair, to make them for two hours to put them in another life. And I can tell you something about that other life, and I highly recommend a book for you and for everybody else. The name of the book is called Proof of Heaven. And it Someone is written by- write in where we can get hold of that. Proof of Heaven. Proof okay. of Heaven. It is written by Aben, E-B-E-N, Alexander. He's a scientist. He's a, a neurologist, uh, 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 he, uh, operates on brains, and he, he describes from the very beginning how his feeling about these things, he had a near-death experience. And what he experienced, what he saw, what he experienced when he was near death is worth knowing. Whether you believe it or not, that's your issue or your problem. I happen to believe it. It simply confirmed what I believed all my life. But what we do in music on earth in a concert is a near heaven experience for most of those people in the audience. They are uplifted. They are absolutely transported out of this world in a live performance. And I stress live performance. Records are wonderful. But in a way, they're phony because everybody's tweaking and fixing and making it perfect and so forth. And we know that nothing is perfect. But it's the best we have. That's what I had to listen to when I was young is records and radio. Now, 
I, if, if I'm in Chicago and a visiting orchestra comes in, I go and hear them. I want them, I want them to play well. I want to hear what's going on in the rest of the world. You know. Do you find it hard sometimes to sit and relax in a concert and have these near heaven experiences because we listen with professional ears, you know? It's, it, I find it very hard to switch off. That's why I love to listen to my orchestra because then the technical side is really so beautiful that you don't have to worry about, you know, mistakes here and there and you can really yeah. just relax. But I find it quite hard to switch off in a concert if I go and listen. That's true, but I, I managed to do it. I turn a little mental thing and, and say, okay, I'm listening to the Vienna Philharmonic now. And what I know, I know before I sit down, it's going to be good. Yeah. And, it's, and it's going to be good to very good to great. Different levels, depending on. And when they're in Chicago or in New York or in Berlin, everybody wants to play as, as wonderful as possible. But I try to play that way when I'm playing in Essen or anywhere. Because they love music too. Do you have this proof of heaven experience while you're playing on stage? Or are you too much in your... Can you just like totally abandon everything and just be lifted by the music? Or do you feel like you're, you're, you're more... You have to be more in control of what you're doing? I have to do, you have to do both. You have to be able to focus, incredibly focus, on a, a myriad of musical details and technical details. And at my age, I can't just, I cannot function on med, on automatic pilot. I simply, I, I, I'm not going to do that. It's going to be, uh, what do I want to do in this phrase? Not, can I do it better than I did 30 years ago? Uh, I, I probably can't. I don't know. But my, all my experience and my love of music and my, my desire to, to give a, a, a wonderful experience to everybody, that comes together. And, and I try to, to play it as beautiful as I possibly can for the moment. Ask an opera singer when they sing the same role 50 times, what are they, what are they thinking about? Uh, Bruno Yannicki, somebody asked him, Mr. Yannicki, what he was, he was solo horn in the New York Philharmonic in 1920, in the 20s and 30s. He says, Mr. Yannicki, when you're playing so beautiful, what, what are you thinking about? He said, Madam, invariably the next note. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, th there is magic in all of this, but there is very real, tangible things that we have to concentrate on. Does anything worry you at all? Uh, what do you mean, worry? On stage, or in life, whatever you care to choose. I, I, I would, I always want to live up to my own standards, and the standards which have been set for a hundred years in my orchestra, and to be, and to deserve to be where I am, to continue to deserve to be where I am. I, <coughs> that is a very high priority. I don't want to embarrass myself or embarrass my colleagues or, or whatever. And so, but I, I never wanted to do that. It always, I always wondered in my mind, what does Hersha think about what I'm doing? What does Jacobs think? Sometimes they would actually tell me. Sometimes not. We would like go what? for me. Like what? I would, I would deliberately ask Jacob sometimes, Jake, you haven't said very much about my playing in a long time. I want you to listen very specifically to me in this rehearsal and tell me if you think there is any problem which is brewing, which, is, which may happen, or something that I should, I should be concerned about. And most of the time, he would say, Dale, you're, Dale, you're fine. It's wonderful. Keep it up, because I have these wonderful musicians around me to imitate and emulate, and and then I have my own ideas of what to do. Then, if a great conductor comes up and he he's worth worth uh, really trying to do what they want, if 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 the conductor really makes a difference, many of them don't. We play better than they conduct. 
And I know that happens in the Berlin Philharmonic many times. You, you play better than they conduct. And, and, Sometimes. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, I don't really worry. Uh, I, I want to keep my health as good as possible. I want to be, I worry about other things. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good father. I reunited with two of my older children. And, and you talk about heaven when every time I get together with them, it's absolutely mind-blowing. I know so many colleagues who have nothing to do with their children. Mm -hmm. and, and all of this affects, affects your playing. Everything is tied together. Everything is connected. How you live, how you think, how you, how you eat, the shape that your body is in, how you practice. We are as good as our habits. That's what Michael said yesterday. I'm trying to develop, to redevelop, to rediscover new and better habits. And anywhere I can learn those, it's fine with me. I want it on my epitaph that I was open-minded to the very end. Yeah. Um, Dale, uh, Kendall has just asked about earlier on, something about earlier on, you were invited to leave the CSO for a major orchestra back to East. You turned to Bud and Jake and asked if they planned to stay and play for the long term in Chicago. So they were really your mentors. That's a guy who really right. knows, knows a lot about you. So they were yeah. real mentors for you. Absolutely. I, uh, the, the Boston Symphony called me and, and Seji said to me, he says, why would you leave Chicago? And he was conducting there. But I went immediately to both separately to Jacobs and Herseth. And I said, do you plan to play in Chicago as long as you humanly possible, as, you, as long as you can? And he said, both of them said, absolutely. I said, I'm not going to Boston. Fantastic story. Fantastic story. I, I, I'm staying here. Now, I could have maybe had a wonderful career in Boston. I don't know. It's, it, right now, it's a moot point. doesn't well, matter. You had a pretty good career in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Dale, it's incredible. We have all these people asking you questions. I will get to a few of them. I promise you guys. Sorry, I just keep thinking all these things myself. I want to ask Dale. A couple of things we'll get to right now. Um, what was Schulte like to play for? Ask Mark. Schulte, from the very first rehearsal, Schulte was ultra prepared. Always, always knew exactly what he wanted showed uh, we, we knew that he was a good musician but you know when we found out how great a musician he was oh. later later on in his career he started practicing piano again is he hadn't played for 30 years and he started practicing again and he played for us mozart oh, wow. i could i couldn't believe my ears it was on the level of a Baron Boyne or Andras Schiff, and he played with those guys. Our, our, uh, uh, really, several other wonderful Mozart players, Michiko, Uchida. You know, he was in that level of playing, wow. it, and we thought, "Wow, he's been our music director for twenty years, and here he is now. He's playing piano again. It's fantastic." Now we, we had to get used we had to get used to his movements, which were rather angular, but he was an angular man that was he you know he was Hungarian and very uh, visceral in his approach to conducting. He was a rhythmic conductor. Is it politically correct for me to ask you if you have a favorite? No, because you're a conductor yourself, of course. Ah. Uh, well, I don't know who's listening to this. I can I can tell you, to me. Probably none of your favorites. <laughs> to, to me, some of the there are so many great experiences that I had with with so many different conductors. It's it's just almost impossible to rate one over the other. It's just impossible, nearly impossible. But I have never played with a musician who was 
more amazing in every way, musically, than Daniel Barenboim. Happy birthday, Daniel. Just happy yes, birthday. Happy, happy birthday. If you're listening to this, uh, some friends from the orchestra went over there. I'm sorry, I couldn't. It was a big but party. He's, he's on another planet. Yeah. Musically. Yeah. If some orchestras don't get that, that's their problem. You know, that's, that's okay. I, I, I played chamber music with him, uh, Mozart piano concertos, Beethoven piano concertos. From uh, Horn Trio? Uh, Horn Trio, yeah. The, the, uh, the, the, our performance of, of Tristan Isola in Chicago and New York, I will never forget it. It's, it's, it's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Electra and dozens of other pieces. Were they better than Schultes? Not necessarily. It's not a matter of better. They were different. I mean, you, when, when we were sitting in the audience after we finished Mahler 5 in New York, Carnegie Hall, and the clapping for 20 minutes, how much better does it get? Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. And I was, I was only 31 when that happened. Wow. Incredible. But, but there's, you know, we play some phenomenal concerts with Carlos Kleiber. We're the only yeah. orchestra in America that he that he came to. I wish I played with him. I never played with him live. I would, that's one thing I wish I had done. All about music. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't a great technical conductor, but my gracious, you 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 felt this. It was like playing with Bernstein. This this heavenly experience of of making music. We're so damn lucky we do what we do. Very few people in the world get to do something that makes us happy and makes the world happy to enjoy. We're, we are just incredible, at, at, incredibly lucky, fortunate. And I, as there, there's a question that, that I ask myself. When my father, when I started piano at seven, and my father took me to symphony and opera concerts. Why did music grab me? What was it about it? And I don't know the answer because it doesn't grab everybody the same. It, it, it grabbed me, I grabbed back, and uh, I've been living a life which I, 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 I almost can't believe. No, I don't want it to end. I don't want to retire in one form. But on the other hand, you know, somebody else needs to come along and... But you'll, you'll carry on conducting, so you're not going to leave music. I certainly will. Uh, uh, my maestro has indicated to me that he would help me in that vine. And, Fantastic. Yeah. So if it happens, it happens. Wherever I conduct, I try to conduct in a level that I play. You even, conducted Daniel, you even conducted Daniel Barrowboy. Unbelievable. <laughs> Absolutely unbelievable. When I was, I was conducting him in one of, the, one of the list piano concertos, we did both of them. And I looked around at him, he was sitting at the piano, and he was just smiling at me. Oh. That, would, that gave me such confidence and such conf confirmation. You know, I, I, it, it, was, it was just wonderful. Oh, I was happy for you for that. Right, Dale, we are going to go, we're going to do short answers to these questions because I feel really bad. We have all these people watching you who I'm really grateful for to you watching and I never get around to all your questions. I'm so sorry because Dale is just too fascinating to stop and sometimes the questions come in an order which don't really fit the, what we're talking about. But okay. how about if I just go through and we do a few really quick ones and then we'll sign off with Jeff and all go and have a coffee. Okay, how okay. about that? Okay, Stefan wants to know, when are you going to record John Williams' horn concerto? Probably never. Never. Good. That's a good answer. Why? Because he wrote it, I did it, the premiere in 2004, and he has tried to talk Sony into recording it ever since, and they somehow are not, uh, are not buying it. And okay, well, obviously... That's, uh, so you that's get... eight years ago, and the piece is not getting any easier. The second movement is nearly impossible to play. 
Okay. So. Okay. Next question, um, uh, Richard in Melbourne. Richard, you must be up very late because Tim is. Uh, so I know how late it is. Were you ever influenced by the Verve brothers? Absolutely. The the first time I ever played with the New York Philharmonic was Shostakovich's Seventh Symphony with Bernstein conducting. You know, it has two brass sections. Mm -hmm. I was playing sixth horn. I was sitting between Joe Singer, my friend, and one of my teachers. And on my right was Harry Burv, <laughs> the, the, third, the third horn of Tuscanini, author Harry. I went out to Arthur's house one time and met him in, in Long Island. So I actually met Arthur. I never knew Jack. And Harry I played with. We called him Dapper Dan. He was always in a tie and a blue, beautiful suit and very, uh, very elegantly dressed. But it was a pleasure to play with him. And... Uh, he was always very busy teaching, going to Montreal and so on, but uh, it was a fantastic experience. Yes, I, I was, I was ex uh, exposed to them by listening to their records. And, and as I said, that's, that's how I learned a lot of music, by listening to records. Well, yeah, we should all do more of that. Now we have YouTube, which is great, but the real quality of the, hear of the listening you can only get from the, the recorders. Um, your favorite orchestral solo, can you pin it down? Oh, no. No, I didn't think because, so. <laughs> what, I mean, I love very much the, the uh, romantic era. Yeah. That's the, re the reason I play the horn. Brahms, Tchaikovsky, uh, Dvorak, uh, Wagner, Bruckner, Mahler, all of those. I, I really like them. And, but... Above that, I like Mozart. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. I, I listen to Mozart and I think, my gracious, what a darn genius. <laughs> what, what, a, what a genius. How did he think to do this? So simply, so elegantly, so fine. And he knew every note before he ever wrote it down. I, I, can't, I can't, I don't relate to that, what he did. All I do is enjoy what he did. Genius. You're a lot of geniuses around in this music world. Yeah. I'm not one of them, unfortunately, or whatever. But I think we beg to differ on this hangout, Dale. No, um, no. The, you, I'm going to send you the chat. People are so happy and so honored. Your students here, Kevin, they're saying all the students here at Indiana love having you. They love having you here. You are so inspiring. I know when I came to play with you guys and met you for the first time, I can't even begin to tell you how inspiring you were for me. Um, you, you are just inspiring us all here online. Thank you so much. Um, I, yeah, what can I say? You're incredible. and. Hut ab, as we say in German, chapeau. Um, sorry, I want to give you a big, big hug right now. It means a lot to us to have you online. It really Thank does. you very much, Sarah. Where's Jeff? Is he going to come and save the moment? Come on. Jeff? Tell me. Yeah, thank you. That's what I wanted. <laughs> no, I'm it's... <laughs> Thank you, Dale. Thank you so much. It's really incredible. Jeff, talk to us. Tell me what you guys have planned for this week. Um, just uh, Last night we went bowling. Oh. <laughs> Tomorrow night we're having a party. Yeah. We do this uh, secret Santa thing, so we're kicking that off with gifts for each other and keeping the gift giving, you know, secret and all that for the fun for the last two weeks of classes before exams end. Uh, I'm playing uh, the piece tonight. Um, by Matthias, a pin, pin, pinchner. Pinchner. Uh, pinchner. That can't. Yes, I always get his name wrong. Yes. He's a good friend of ours here. Really yeah, awesome. yeah. He's he was wonderful. He was here conducting this summer our festival orchestra. So we spoke about doing it. But yeah. Um, yeah. And otherwise, just people are flocking to the, any room that Dale is is in, and he all his lessons are open. Um, and so he's got a a full room all day, every day, and he's just really beautifully holding court. And, and, uh, Dale, on the live chat, it's just been announced that you're a pretty good, fo you're a well-focused bowler. So obviously, uh, Kevin was out bowling with you last <laughs> night. <laughs> I haven't bowled in 35 years. My oh, arm, 
my arm is paying for it right now. But <laughs> fortunately, it's my right arm. I don't need it to play. <laughs> Well, you guys, um, I'm going to let you go now because we've got to let poor Tim get to bed in Melbourne. It's the middle of the night. Um, you, Dale, you're here quite often, so if you wouldn't mind, we would love to have you back on because the, the horn world's going crazy to, to see and hear you live. Um, you. So if Jeff can arrange it for us, let's, let's have that breathing hour. Let's get back and really talk about that. And, okay. Um, there's just so much more to talk about. Sorry to everyone whose questions I haven't answered, but we will get... We will get Dale back on, I absolutely promise. Yeah. Thank you. Nice okay. to see you, Sarah. Nice, nice, nice to see you too. Lots of love to Indiana, to you boys. Thanks, Thank Jeff, you. for all the help. Pleasure. Thank you, Sarah. Have a great day. Bye, Dale. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye, everybody. See you soon. Bye. Bye.